Bible, so hope you have. This Bible is something else, folks. In the book of Genesis, chapter 48 this morning. 48th chapter of Genesis. And verse number 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my father Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Father, bless your word now, your holy word. In thy name I pray. Lord, give me strength this morning. Give me strength to preach this. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The fathers, the patriarchs, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's the foundation of the Jewish nation. That's the foundation of the Old Testament. It all focuses upon Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob. I cannot stress that and emphasize that enough. These are the fathers, and this is what Jacob said here. He said, these are the fathers, and he said plainly, the fathers Abraham and Isaac, and he's following in their footsteps, and he's about to end his life. It's about over for him, just like it will be for all of us if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back. And I don't have to urge you this morning enough to say to you that you may feel like you're going to live forever. You may feel like that, uh, that uh, the grim reaper will never show up at your house, that something uh, strange or miraculous is going to happen, and that you'll never see death, and that you'll get caught out the rapture, and that'd be wonderful, but it may not happen. And you need to prepare yourself for this moment. You need to prepare yourself. The Bible says that when uh, Lazarus dies, the angels came and carried him. Yeah, but when the poor man died, he, the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's, into Abraham's bosom, Lazarus. And we know, my dear friend today, that when that moment comes, we need to be ready. Jacob was ready. This is not the Jacob that took hold of his brother's heel at birth. This is not the usurper. This is not the deceiver. This is not the fugitive that ran for all those years away from his brother Esau. This is the one who had reaped what he sowed. This is the one who was facing death. He'd been disciplined by God. He'd been chastised. But God had raised him to a higher level. In every way that God had ever dealt with Jacob, Jacob knew more about the Lord when he was finished with him. That makes life worth living. And I want, to, I want you to, I can't emphasize it enough this morning. That everything about who we are and what we are is not about this building. And it's not about the people around you. It's not even about uh, some book you hold in your hand and I love the Bible. It's about God. It's about God. It's about God. And this is what we get from Genesis chapter number 48. We find Jacob finished. And if you notice in verse number 15 of Genesis 48, and he blessed Joseph. And if you'll notice in verse number 16 of, of verse number, uh, chapter 48, verse 16, he talked about the angel that redeemed him. Then he talked about the God who fed him. He said, God has provided from every day of my life. Amen. Jacob came into this world a hold of the, of the heel of his brother. Now think on that. Have you really thought through that? Think on that. Here's a child being born. Yet that child takes hold of the heel of his brother. Well, you say, did he consciously do that? Well, I don't know. What about Jeremiah? When Jeremiah, the Bible says, when, before I knew thee, I formed thee in the womb. Amen. What about John the Baptist? When he heard of the birth of Christ, he jumped up and down inside his mother's womb. There's some things that just don't, they defy explanation. And I know one thing's for certain. If God wants to come upon your soul and speak to you, he can speak to you at any time. During your existence. So I leave it where it is. I don't have to have the answer to everything. I just know who the answer is. Amen. That's what matters. But we've got Jacob. He's quite a man. If there, he's the only man in the Bible that, is as the, that has the clearest distinction of the two natures of anybody. 
There's the old Jacob and the new Jacob. Amen. There's two of them. The old one and the new one. And if you'd known Jacob, you'd known somebody that was, uh, he could smile, shake your hand, be your friend, but he was constantly looking for a way that he could profit from you. Go behind your back. Jacob's the deceiver. Jacob's the liar. But he was in good company when he was around Laban because that's exactly what Laban was. Exactly. That was Rebekah's brother, by the way. Laban was quite a thing, the Syrian. Oh, yeah. He was, a, he was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was all of that. And so when, when, when Jacob wound up there at Padan Aram with, with Laban, he reaped what he sowed. He had two wives, Leah. He had the one he loved. Which, who was that one? Which one did he love? Rachel. He loved Rachel. Why did he love? Because she's beautiful. That's why he loved her. Rachel was beautiful. So therefore, we find Jacob, just like most out here, he was following vain beauty. He was following the outward show. Now, there's nothing wrong with being beautiful, ladies. Not a thing. But you will not always look like a 17-year-old. Not always. Your beauty, though, in a lady is superior to a man's beauty. There's something about mothers that God gave them that is such a precious thing indeed. There's something about a woman that if she's a real woman and she's the kind of woman that God made her to be, man's gonna, he's going to respect her. He's going to love her. He's gonna, he'll defend her. And this is one of the most insidious, godless things that can ever speak to my soul is this crowd today that's trying to destroy gender identification. God help us. You talk about a sick bunch. Amen. Boy, that burns me to the soul. Whatever you are born as, that's what you are. And then ask the Almighty to give you grace. Teach you what it is to be a male or teach you what it is to be a female. You got nothing to be ashamed of if you're born a male and you got nothing to be ashamed of if you're born a female. That's the way God made you. That's the way you came into this world. So we find Jacob following what he could see. But the Bible said Leah had soft eyes. She had gentle eyes. That meant that Leah had a soft heart, a gentle heart. She was an entirely different woman from Rachel. I'm not saying Rachel was bad, but I'm saying there was a difference between the two women. A vast difference. And you know how the Almighty works, don't you? He took the one that had been rejected essentially, and you know, and she just... Jacob just had to do what he had to do, take her so he could get Rachel. God blessed her, and she began to have children. <laughs> She's the one, the Jews even to this day, say that Leah is the one that built Israel. That's what they say. They say that of her, that she built Israel. Amen. And so she did. So Jacob, we know, started like everybody else starts, following his sight, following his nose, following his feeling, following the five senses of his body, could go no deeper than deeper than what he could see, he could feel, he could touch. And this, of course, is where every agnostic and atheist finds himself today. If he can't sense a spiritual thing, then he denies it entirely. And the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Amen. Amen. He'll never receive them. But the day that you're born again and saved by the grace of God, you can directly come in touch and communion with Almighty God at that very moment. Amen. Amen. That happened to me in 1973 and blew me away. How about you? They came in direct con. Nobody had to tell me from that day on there was a God. No siree, I'd met him and I knew him and I know him now. So Jacob is coming down to the end of his way. He's, stopped, he's, he's finished. His time on earth, his sojourn here. We are pilgrims and strangers. We have no continuing city in this world. As it says in Hebrews 11, our time will come. But you see the difference is that with Jacob, he went down to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom. But my dear friend, that's not where I'm going. If the Lord comes to get me today, if this is my last message at Temple Baptist Church, I'll meet you by the river. That's where I'm going. Amen. 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 Like this brother was in here the other day, Brother McNeese, I think he was. He was up here preaching about six months ago, a year ago, and he said these guys broke into this woman's house and rammed a gun up underneath her, underneath her face and said, I'll blow your head off. And she says, you can't scare me with heaven. It stuck with me. <laughs> you can't scare me with heaven because that's exactly where she would go. 
go to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, and then you go to purgatory, right? No, I'm sorry. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. And so it was. He said, the God that fed me. It took him a while to learn that. Some of you haven't really learned it yet. You really haven't. Because if you ever really get a hold of the fact that what your food you eat, the house you live in, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, is given to you by the hand of the Lord. You just happen to be working. <laughs> the gifts and the blessings are of God. And it ought to make you thankful. And when, it, when, you, when you become thankful, it humbles you. And, hum and humility before God is the greatest of all. Amen. God's not impressed by how smart you are. God's not impressed by what you've accomplished. He's not impressed by how much money you got in the bank. But you come to Him as a little child or as a woman that says, if I can just touch the hem of His garment, He'll open His arms wide and He'll receive you. So He said, the God that fed me. But I like where He said, the God that redeemed me. The angel which redeemed me. That angel, of course, is capital I. Why is that? That's the angel of the Lord. They're both referring to the same one, but there's a little difference going on here. But the angel that redeemed me, only God can redeem you, folks. To redeem means that to be to redeem means to bring out, to bring to, to, to reach in and take and bring back to where it had been before. That's important. Redeem doesn't mean that he just reached in and pulled you out and set you down. That's not redemption. Redemption is when God comes and He takes back that which belongs to Him. Amen. And pulls you back to where you belong. That's where we came. I came from God. Where'd you come from? You might have been a tadpole crawling up out of a pond somewhere. Well, that's your problem. But I didn't come crawling up out of some pond. I came from God. My spirit did. He's the father of spirits. That's where I came. I'm going home one day. And one day you walk into the gates of glory, you'll say, boy, I recognize that. Why, good night, I've seen that before. Well, look at that street right over there. These houses, these people. Your home. Amen. I may not know every detail about everything and exactly how everything looks, but I know home when I see it. Amen. I'll be home. And so he was redeemed from being a cheater. He was no longer a cheater. Redeemed from being a deceiver. He's no longer a deceiver. Redeemed from being a fugitive. He's not running anymore. God had raised him to a higher level spiritually. And usually, the fact is, I haven't seen it any different. It's always steps. God raises you by step. One step after another step. He raises you higher to a higher spiritual level. Jacob didn't start that way. He started at the bottom. But he wound up being able to bless. Baruch. That's what the he Baruch. That means to bless. That means to give. That means to put the blessings of God upon someone. We bless because we've been blessed. We give because we've received. What do we have? Except we received it from God. And this is what Jacob did. He blessed him. I want you to look at Psalm chapter 27 and verse 13. Thank you, Lord. Man, did he ever give me some strength. I was so tired and weak over there a minute ago. I couldn't even stand. And now I feel like a, I'm ready to run. I'll be ready to fall here in a few minutes probably. Right now I'm running. <laughs> uh, only I know what I'm talking about in God. Psalm 27 verse 13. Look what David said. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now when you get a few years under your belt and you really begin to hold what life's about, and how that it can hand you a, it can hand you a bad, bad, bad experience. It can bless you. It can give to you. There will be days of the mountaintop and the sun shining, the winds, blow, the air, the sweet, the flowers you smell. The angels are singing. You say, "Glory to God!" Just like Peter did. Let's stay up here at the top of that mountain of transfiguration. This is a good place. And of course, I'd like to have been there too. But you can't stay on top of that mountain. You can't stay up there. There's going to be times when surprises overtake you. Yeah. I remember a funeral when I hadn't been saved long. It was down at Third Creek Baptist Church. I'll never forget this. Some things, you know, i got a terrible memory, but th some things are burned into my mind. This young woman, she was in her 20s. She's sick. She had cancer. And she was dying. And uh, her family was well known in the church. I don't remember his name, but she was dying. And we watched her as she 
dwindled away. And I remember the last thing I remember her saying, the last thing I remember her saying was, she said, I'm so weak, I'm so weak, I'm so weak. And it wasn't long after that she passed away. But I went by the casket, and her little body was lying there. And her hands were folded like this, like this. And there was that ring on her finger. Married. Her husband stood over the casket and he wept. I'll never forget that ring. That ring cost a pile of money. That's her ring, though. He buried her with her ring, with his love. And we wept. I remember how I cried when I saw that. And I knew that young woman had been cut down. That was before I realized how sweet heaven really can be. You see, it took me a few years to get over where I came from. It really did. And then I began to think about where I'm going. And I, th I, I, I quit thinking so much about where I came from. And now, believe me, now, believe me, I think a lot about where I'm going. Because I can see the end down there. I don't know how far away it is, but it's down there. And it doesn't scare me. Because I know whom I have believed. I know where I'm going. Hallelujah to God. Amen. I don't know of anything in this world any better than that to know where you're going. Some of you are scared to death. And I'm not trying to be mean. But if you got a bad report from the doctor, you'd start trembling and shaking. You'd try to find this, try and find that, do something about it. And you can't do anything about it. My life is hid with Christ in God. We live in a doctor's office and, and, the, and the pharmacy over here. I know them real good and they know me good. <laughs> here he comes again. I don't know how many different medications I'm on. How many doctors I got to see. I say to, I say to Linda, I say, who we got to go see this week? Which doctors lined up for us? One doctor right after that. Good people. It's not putting doctors down. Thank the Lord for the doctors. But I remember a time when I never went to the doctor, never took any medication or none of that. And now here I am. Good night. Pills lined up. Boy, I get them. I got me a pill thing where you open it up and it, and, and it's, and it, you know, all your pills. Because I can't remember anything. But I open them all up and I fill them all up and I know I got all my pills. Anybody, anybody else in here taking that many pills? Look at the hands flutter. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, well. you know what I'm talking about, then, don't you? Pill, pill. Not just me, she's got her pills, too. Good night, I'll be taking them and I'll say, would you like to have a pill? <laughs> Make a joke of it. She said, I got all, I got my pills, I don't need your pills. So we keep our pills separate. Pills, pills, pills. <laughs> Wasn't for, let me tell you what keeps Walgreens and, and, and the rest of them going is old people like me. And then the ones the doctors have prescribed medication to. Amen. Amen. And I'm not throwing off on them, thank God for them. But that's just the way life is. You get to the point. Where heaven begins to get sweeter. Yeah. You begin to think about it. I came to church this morning thinking about something that happened over 50 years ago. And it became clear in detail. I began to think about stuff like that. Things that happened 50 years ago. Think at boot camp. When I went through boot camp in the Marine Corps. I came in here this morning thinking about that. I was 17 years old when I went to Paris Island, South Carolina. Basketball player, ran track. I was an athlete. So the physical part never bothered me one bit. But here we are, 80 men. And we are in quick time. Then we're going. And you know, and you're moving. And then you look over here, and your drill instructor has turned around backward. And you go right along with you. I thought, good night, man. I'm not kidding you. So why do I remember that? Because I had been here a while. This is Jacob. He'd been here a while. Now he's leaving. And he doesn't want to be, get bitter. He says in verse number 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Notice the way he said it. He didn't say, he didn't say, I saw the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's not the text. Look at the words carefully. I had fainted Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land. In other words, I wanted to see God's hand in it. 
whether I could understand it or not. Life can get hard. It can get tough. And he said, I want to see God's hand in it. He's a good God. He'll make it good. And all things work together for good for those that love God called according to his purpose. He said, I want to see, I will see the hand of the Lord in the land of the living. That'll get you through. You can live with that. Or you can become cynical. You can become hard. You can become bitter. You can become where everything's wrong, nothing's good, and you're full of hate, and you're miserable as you can be. People like that. They are. They find no good in anything. It's all bad. That's the way a lot of people are. They get up every day of their life and they moan and groan spiritually all day long because the world has beaten them to death. It has. It's working on you right now. Circumstances are working on this brother old kid been over here crying. He could have been crying. but No, he's not crying. He's thanking God for bringing him through it. Amen. He's thanking God for bringing him through it. And the good Lord brought him through it. Amen. The angel of the Lord campeth about them that fear him. He see, he's the one who knows how bad it's going to be, how far it's going to go, and how much it's going to hurt. He knows. Thanks be unto God. So I do. I am by the grace of God. I'll look for the good that I can find in the land of the land. And there's a lot of good, too. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of people take their shirt off of their back. They'll give you the last dime they got in their pocket. They'll give you the food off their table. Amen. They will. They will. They will. All people aren't arrogant and filthy and dirty and stinking and full of the devil. There's a lot of Christians out there that are good, sweet, tender people. And they love the Lord. And they're the kind of people that you want in your life. So he said, because he could bless, he was not going to be bitter. He knew his people. He knew his sons. You can read what Jacob said in the last couple of chapters there of the book of Genesis. Boy, did he ever know his sons. If a daddy ever knew his children, Jacob knew his children. Oh, boy. You ought to read it. We don't have time in a message this morning for all that, but you ought to read it. He doesn't pull any punches, boy. I mean, he lays it out there. He said, look at them. And he told what they were like. Then he prophesied about what they would be. Because he's a prophet now, folks. He started as a usurper, as a deceiver. Now he's a prophet. And he's blessing people. Amen. That's a long way, isn't it? And so he knew his sons. You know people. I've learned them. <laughs> I've looked in the mirror and I've seen a lot of people in that mirror. <laughs> I'm just like them. There's a lot about Jacob right there. I say, oh me, oh Lord me, help me. You put me right there in the book of Genesis. And praise, by, praise the Lord by the grace of God. He's brought me a little higher, a few steps higher, a little closer. I've learned something. I'm a little nearer. I have. I pray I have. I believe I have. And I hope you have. I hope you understand it's a journey. It's a journey, folks. It's a journey. And he knew his sons. This is his testimony, folks, that he met God at Peniel. Peniel means face to face. Face to face. The Old Testament figure was... I've seen God, I'm going to die. That's what they believed. If I've seen the Lord, it's finished for me. I'm done for. It's just a matter of time. I'm gone. But Jacob looked at him face to face. Just like Abraham, face to face. And Moses, face to face. They met him face to face. Let me tell you something I've learned about the Lord. You can get as close to God as you want to get. You can have as much of him as you want. He'll not force himself on anybody. He'll not make you pray. Sometimes you wish you had. He won't make you come to church. He won't make you live right. Get to the point where you wish you had. He won't make you do it. He doesn't drive his sheep. He leads them along. How much of God do you want? You can't get him from the preacher. Won't come from the church. Good people, that's all fine. But that's not where you're going to get a hold of God. You're going to get a hold of God in the place inside your heart and in your soul that he'll show you. That's where he'll meet with you and that's where he'll commune with you. And that'll be the sweetest thing you had on this earth is communion with God. He's the God of the sinner. He didn't start as a saint, but God was patient with him. The Lord knows sinners. I'll give you a few things here and I'll close with this, but I want you to listen to me now. The Lord knows sinners. Amen. He knows them. He understands them. He knows what makes them tick. He's all about sinners. He really is. 
If the Lord wanted to make a new universe, no big deal. He turns back to the sinner. He's about sinners. Well, I'm a sinner, preacher. I've got to clean up my act before I can come to the Lord. No, you're a hypocrite when you do that and self-righteous. You don't clean up your act coming to God. You come just as you are. I failed him a thousand times, preacher. Can't keep my faith. I get up there where I'm walking to the Lord, and he said, and, and some little Mickey Mouse thing will happen, and first thing you know, I've lost my faith. I'm groveling in the dirt. I don't know what to do. Come to him. Amen. Ask him to give you what you need. Yes. Yes. Just talk to him. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. All right? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Amen. He's all about sinners. He tasted the sinner's death. Yes. Wouldn't you? Aren't you glad you don't have to die like, you were, like you've lived your life if you've gotten Amen. right with God? Amen. You get right with You don't have to die like that. I, would, I wouldn't want to die like a murderer, would you? No, sir. I wouldn't want to die like that. He tasted the murderer's death, though. Are you a murderer? You a rapist? Are you a... Are you a... Are you, are you the... Are you the dregs... Of humanity. When you say preacher. God wouldn't have anything to do. He died for you. I don't care how low you get. He died for you. Would have all men to be saved. He felt the wrath of God. And because he felt the wrath of God. He knows how God feels. Toward the sinner. And he made him to be sin. Who knew no sin. And by that, the Bible said that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Therefore, God exercised His wrath, His justice, His appeasement, everything that would make God able to commune with people on a different level. He did it through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you never have to worry with it again. His invitation. He knows what motivates us. He knows how we struggle. He knows what we think. And he's called the friend of sinners. I don't know what to say to you this morning except that why don't you come and try him? You've tried religion. You've tried the Christian religion. And the Christian religion is not Christ. It's awful easy in a religious setting to get sucked up in it. But I don't want anything to do with the Christian religion. I want Christ. But he'll give you rest. I'm going to close with this this morning. I'll speak from experience. How do I get rest? I went to Israel. Been there six times. When I got off of that jet, put my feet down on the promised land, I felt something run through me. All the time I was there, I could feel something moving inside my soul. Excitement building. My burdens as a pastor I left behind. I always do that when I take a vacation. I get a certain distance away from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I can just feel it lift. I've told her that a thousand times. I feel that burden lifting. Like a bird, I could fly. I get to the Holy Land. That's what happens. My mind is stimulated. I am not one to go to the beach and lay in the sand and bake all day long. <laughs> If that's your idea of a vacation, not mine, not mine. If there ever was a place on this earth that would stimulate your mind, it is Israel. All these things you've read in the Bible, they're right there. I feel my mind stimulated. My burden's been lifted. I feel myself pulled and drawn and connected with a place like you wouldn't believe. And when that happens... I have times with God. I remember when I walked up on top of the Samaria. You remember, do you remember Ahab when he had Naboth stoned to death? He was the king of Samaria, okay? The northern tribes. He was their king. Did you know that that castle is still standing? It's just in ruins, but it's still there. It's up on the hill, the hill of Samaria. I got up there and I started looking around that thing and I looked down at the slope down there and I thought Naboth was down there. And they stoned him to death. And this Ahab sitting up here in his castle was not satisfied with this. 
He had to have that man's vineyard. Of course, his, who was his wife? What was her name? Jezebel. Only one Jezebel in the Bible. And Jezebel, of course, put her voice to his ear and said, you can do this. Let me tell you something. I had an experience with God at the top of that mountain. It was something. And then all over that place. All over that place. And do you know what? When I got back to the States, every time that I've been to the Holy Land, when I come back, I've been revived. Amen. That's revival. Amen. We got one scheduled a few weeks from now. Say more about it later. We go, well, let's put it this way. We got a preacher scheduled to come and preach to us for three or four days. And we might get a revival out of it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. I'm looking forward to it. He's a good preacher. He's a good preacher. And I mean to tell you right now, he's a good man. He loves the Lord. I'd like to see anything we need here at Temple Baptist Church. I'd like to see it happen because I love you. I'm your pastor. I want what's best for you. So let's start praying about the revival now. Father, in thy name I pray. I bless your name. Can't believe it, Lord. <laughs> good night. I can't believe how much better I feel now than I did when I was sitting over there. And I know you did this for me. And I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you for it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Lord, if we have somebody in this house today, they, they want a little closer. They want to know a little more about you. They love you, but they want to love you a little more. They serve you, but they want to serve you more in different ways, maybe. Maybe they've got a burden upon their soul. Maybe there's somebody in their family that, that's in desperate need of prayer. Maybe they're in desperate need of prayer. Maybe they're thinking about leaving. They're thinking about walking out of the church and never coming back again. The devil's beating them down to that point where they can say there's no help. There's no hope. I'm finished. I pray for them. I pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.